So I wanted to start off by telling a story about one of my earliest experiences as an arts educator. Um, about 17 years ago, uh, this was after my first year of college, I had the opportunity to facilitate art projects at an outpatient facility uh, for dual diagnosis patients, and that means patients with both substance abuse um, issues as well as mental illness. And uh, the previous art facilitator, I was told, had done a lot of projects like finger painting and making uh, flower collages out of paper, things like that. And of course, after my first year of art school, I was not going to do finger painting. So I, I came up with a very different kind of project. So it was a pretty simple project. Let's see, is this one go? Yes. Uh, the first step of this project was to draw the shape of a face on a piece of paper. The second step uh, was to um, lay in where the facial features were going to go. And the third step of the project was to um, grab some magazines and start to cut out a number of images. And they were told to do a self-portrait, not of what they looked like, but what it, what it felt like to be them. What was going on inside their head? So this is an example not from the class I'm talking about, but from a later version of this. So. Um, what was normally a pretty uneventful and calm uh, art session um, at the facility ended up taking a pretty dark turn. So about halfway through, um, one woman broke down in tears, said she couldn't finish the project, and walks out of the room. Um, another student started to break down, but said it was really important that she finish the project. And uh, then um, one of the students who had done um, a quite stunning uh, version of this project with one half of the face entirely made out of little black pieces of paper, um, had a schizophrenic split, began threatening me and other students, arguments broke out in the classroom, and the session had to be shut down about halfway through. So I was brought in the next day, and I was told that I would not be coming back. <laughs> so, so this is one of my earliest experiences as an arts educator, and it has really influenced the way that, that I thought about arts education through um, throughout my entire career. So there are three very important things that I've learned from this session. So the first is that making art can be an incredibly powerful experience for people. Um, I've always made art. I did not realize how powerful an experience it could be in certain contexts. Next, art is a big word that means vastly different things to different people. And third, uh, different kinds of art produce very different outcomes in the classroom. So uh, the first point, um, art being powerful, I'm not going to dwell uh, too much on that point. I, I think you, you wouldn't be here if you didn't already believe that. I think a lot of the stories I'm going to tell you in this presentation will illustrate that. So. Uh, the second point, though, or what I'm really going to focus in on, is um, provide you with some very different perspectives of what arts integration can mean, what art is in general, and hopefully I'm going to challenge some of the preconceived notions you may have had about what it, uh, what it means to teach and to produce art. So first we have to pare down this enormous word, art. Now, um, art is a word kind of like sports. Uh, if somebody says, I play sports, that's really not enough information to know what it is they do. They could be talking shuffleboard, or they could be talking Thai boxing. And there are huge differences in between. Those two things have almost nothing to do with each other. And art is kind of the same way. There are very different kinds of art. Um, so the first thing I'm going to encourage uh, people to do is to start talking about art really specifically. Um, so every form of art, whether you like it or not, makes sense when it's viewed through the proper lens. Um, and just like sports, every form of art has its own set of rules, its own set of ideas about what's good and bad, its own set of skills. So it's this huge word. And um, so, so what I'd like to do is try out this lens switching for a few minutes. So if we um, look at art through the lens of classical art, and classical art is one of the most common lenses, whether they know it or not, this is one of the most common lenses people are looking at art through. So classical art is characterized by the accurate representation of light, space, and the human form, and it is a highly technical form of drawing, painting, and sculpture. So this is a great example of uh, classical art. This is the uh, 
School of Athens, done by Raphael. Highly technical, all the perspective is correct, every fold makes sense, every shadow makes sense, every bit of anatomy makes sense. So now let's switch the lens to the lens of Impressionism. Now Impressionism, by contrast, aims to evoke a subjective impression of a scene rather than a recreation of reality, with a particular focus on highly saturated colors and reflected light. So this is a, uh, a, a painting by Monet. And now I saw, I saw some smiles go across people's faces. People saw this and thought it was very nice. However, when Impressionism came out, it was a scandal because nobody knew how to view it through its own lens. People were still viewing art through the lens of classical art. And if we view the, um, Impressionism through the lens of classical art, is it highly technical? Do the colors and shadows, do they represent reality? No. If we view Impressionism through the lens of classical art, it doesn't hold up. So it's very important that we um, start to view the different forms of art through the right lens. And that's something I'm going to talk uh, quite a bit about today. Now let's move on. So it's the lens of abstract expressionism. Abstract, uh, abstract expressionism does away entirely with representation and focuses on creating moods through shapes, colors, textures. So here we have abstract expressionism. And just as the world had gotten comfortable with impressionism, we bring in this different form of artwork with its own set of rules. Now, um, some people like all forms of art, but I often find um, that when people say, oh, I really like art, um, it's, it's, uh, I, I find myself really having to figure out what kind of art. So here are some ways that you can uh, talk about the different kinds of art. You talk about um, what field it's in, the medium, the genre, time period. When somebody says, I like art, um, or um, they, they talk about a kind of art project that they might want to bring in, it's really important that we get as much information and provide as much context as possible um, so we can really provide um, a good lens to view the projects through. And what did the artist intend? Now this is a really important question, because I often hear people talking about art in the context of whether they like it or not. Now, um, as an artist, I think it's really important, um, I, I'm, less, I'm less interested in if people like my work, and much more interested if they can um, agree that I actually did what I set out to do. And those are two very different questions, right? Because you may not like a lot of modern art, but you can probably agree that given the proper lens to look through it, they, the modern artists were achieving what they wanted to do. They were never trying to do representation. It wasn't that they couldn't do more realistic art. That was never the goal of it. So, um, I've seen many conversations where people say, oh, I really like art. And to you, art may look like this. Art may be bright, it may be colorful, it may be life-affirming, uh, but whoever you're talking to, might have a very different view. They might say, oh, I love art. Art is nasty and irreverent and <laughs> it's, it's daring. Now again, these are two very, very different forms of art. And if you're not familiar with this piece, this is uh, Marcel Duchamp's Fountain. Uh, it was a, what he called a ready-made, um, and he put this on a pedestal in a gallery. This is the piece that started the modern art movement. So um, you don't want to end up with a nihilist, abject sculptor in your third grade classroom. <laughs> so, um, one of my favorite lenses to look at drawing through, and I think one of the best opportunities for arts integration, is drawing. Now, uh, I'm a bit biased. I uh, consider myself a draftsman. That's what I do. I do a lot of drawing. Um, and as Bill mentioned, in, uh, I, I, in 2012, I gave a TED Talk I'm arguing about the importance of drawing, and I wanted to uh, to make a couple of those, uh, bring a couple of the ideas here. So the argument for drawing goes something like this. Um, so images are the native language of imagination. So I often talk about when you when you when you remember something from your past. Do you remember a, a paragraph of words describing it? Do you remember an equation that works out something? No, you think about it in images, right? We don't dream in text, we dream in images. So images are the native language of how the imagination works. And um, 
So making images is not only, it, it, I don't consider it just a form of art, but it's actually a really rich form of communication. And it is as rich and as complex as written language. So the most fundamental way to make an image is to draw one. Now, um, one of my favorite things about drawing, and one of the reasons I'm such an advocate for it, is um, not only is it an incredible tool for communication, uh, but it's also already integrated into every art form. There has not been a form of art or a movement of art that hasn't included some form of drawing. And um, a, a, even beyond the arts, when we talk about uh, the practical arts, things like architecture, fashion design, um, illustration, product design, engineering, all of these already have a drawing component. In fact, you cannot become um, a fashion designer or an architect without learning some form of drawing. So it's already embedded deeply in, into these practices. So um, in the spirit of uh, making sure we, we understand the lens that I'm looking at drawing through, I'm going to narrow the lens a little further uh, to observational drawing. And what observational drawing is, it simply means uh, to look at something and to try and draw an accurate representation of it. Um, and so it really um, demands that we really observe and analyze a subject. Now, um, people are often surprised when they come to a drawing class of mine because I don't teach drawing as an art. I actually don't think of drawing as an art form per se. I actually think about it much more as a science. So, um, what I'd like to do, uh, start off with this, uh, looking through the lens of observational drawing, is uh, start off looking at scientific field notes. Now, um, scientific field notes are really interesting because uh, the, the art of drawing has been embedded into the sciences from the very beginning. And at first I wanted to address the, this myth that we have that photography has somehow replaced drawing as a form of documentation. So photography came out in around the 1850s, um, and when it came out, a lot of people stopped using drawing and painting to document things, right? We stopped seeing, we didn't see as many portraits being painted at that point, we didn't see um, as, as many realistic um, pieces of artwork at that point. However, in the sciences, drawing was never intended to be about documentation. Uh, drawing was intended to be a form of learning, a, a way to actively engage uh, the subject. So um, I have a few quotes, and these are from people who are actually um, in the field. So this is by Mac, uh, Michael Canfield. He's the author of Beautiful Data, the Art and Science of Field Notes. So he says the tradition of drawing, or the tradition of field notes, that grew into its own genre over the past three centuries is still relevant to anyone who studies nature. The basic role and importance of field notes are unchanged. So in this field, the uh, photography coming into the picture really didn't phase anybody who was out there in the field studying. So this is an, uh, an early drawing by Galileo Galilei studying the phases of the moon. Um, he was viewing it through his DIY telescope. And um, when you take a look uh, at these drawings, it's important to note that this isn't Galileo saying, I'm going to draw these so I can show them to other people. He's learning about um, this subject through the drawing. So let's do a little thought experiment really quickly. So it's easy to look at this and say, ah, moon. But what if I asked you to draw this line? Suddenly you're looking at an entirely different way, right? Suddenly every zig, every zag suddenly becomes important. So there's a huge difference. And again, you can fill your brain do that. You can look and this is ah, moon or half moon or whatever it is you think. But as soon as you're asked to try and draw it, suddenly all of that information becomes something you have to deal with. You've got to grapple with it. You have to figure it out. So drawing is an incredible tool, again, not just for documentation, um, but to learn about a subject. So, um, another quote, uh, Jenny Keller teaches uh, scientific illustration at UC Santa Cruz. Uh, she says, drawing makes you look more carefully at your subject. As an observational tool, drawing requires that you pay attention to every detail, even the seemingly unimportant ones. So here, of course, is a page from Da Vinci, and once again, imagine trying to describe the human arm just through words and numbers. It just could not be done, right? So again, this, the, this act of, of drawing, of observational and representational drawing, 
Um, it has been embedded in the sciences from the beginning. Jenny Keller also says, uh, as it enhances observation, the process of drawing can also reveal different unexpected aspects of the subject under study. In science illustration, as well as in science, you never know what will turn out to be important. And as you are, um, and as you're engaging your subject, you notice so many more details. Meriwether Lewis, not somebody we tend to think of as an artist, and he would not have necessarily considered himself an artist, but once again, um, we see this uh, description of a fish. It was much easier to describe it visually, as of course that makes a lot of sense when you start thinking about biological sciences. So the fact is, scientific illustrations can achieve certain things that a photograph cannot. A good illustration can portray difficult to photograph or rarely witnessed events. And I love this drawing. This is a more contemporary example of science field notes. And um, so the, uh, the, the scientist here is actually trying to hone in on the specific movements and positions that a bird, uh, that this bird would take. Now again, Words, numbers, not adequate to describe this, right? And even a photograph, you can imagine, um, this, these are the kinds of things you may be able to witness, and, and doing a quick sketch of it might be um, a much better way to report it than a photograph, uh, which tends to distort colors, distort proportions in many ways. So, um, one of the most common questions I get after I make a case for observational drawing is, drawing is great, you should all learn to do it. People often say, okay, well, that, that's nice, but isn't it really hard? Doesn't it take years to learn? And although I would say to, um, to develop a mastery of observational drawing does take years, um, I, uh, the, the phrase used to describe poker often comes to mind with drawing. It takes minutes to learn, but a lifetime to master. But I think there's some truth to that here. The basics of drawing are not that difficult to understand. So one of the metaphors I often use in my classes is that watching somebody do a drawing is kind of like watching somebody perform a magic trick. So when you see somebody perform a magic trick, you don't actually believe magic has occurred. Right? So what you think is that there's some logical explanation for it, but you, if you don't know what that is, this act looks magical. And drawing is very much the same way. To watch a skilled drawer draw a picture, it seems rather magical, um, but the artist just knows these logical, um, these logical solutions, and, if, and which I'm about to teach you now. Once you understand them, drawing actually becomes really accessible. So um, my goal here is not, uh, I'm not claiming that after uh, hearing me talk for 10 minutes about drawing, you're suddenly going to be able to know how to do it. But my goal here is to make it seem accessible to learn. And um, if all you do uh, is learn what I'm about to show you about drawing, if that's it, you can actually become a really competent drawer and you can develop a comfort level. So this image here, um, this is what I open up every single one of my beginning drawing classes with. Uh, this is a drawing by Michelangelo. This is his study for the Libyan Sibyl, which is painted in the Sistine Chapel. Uh, Michelangelo is considered one of the best drawers who, have, who has ever lived, and this is one of the uh, considered one of the best drawings ever done in the history of the world. Um, it is a stunning drawing, huge amounts of detail, and I'm sure you can see the the, um, the science just bubbling up here again. Um, all of the anatomy is accurate; it's an incredible drawing. However, if we start to look up close at it, the drawing reveals some really important uh, secrets about the process of drawing. So, yes. So take a look around the edges here. But what do you see? You see a lot of lines. Now, are they dark lines? No. You see all of these light lines, and what you see are multiple attempts here. Now, there's a misconception that the best drawers somehow start at the edge and they just make these nice dark lines, they move around until somehow they arrive at the finished drawing. But here, we see one of the greatest masters of drawing not getting it right the first time, making multiple attempts at the form. Now, the trick is, he's doing it very, very lightly. So if we look at, look at it from a distance, we hardly notice these light lines, right? In fact, most people don't notice them until they're actually pointed out. 
much like a, uh, the solution to a magic trick. Once you know it, it becomes rather obvious. But here, um, again, once we kind of zoom in a little bit, all over the place, we can see these very light beginning lines. In fact, if you look at some of these first uh, sketches for the fingers, I mean, they almost look like uh, children could have drawn them. These aren't the lines of a master. These are just the lines of somebody exploring a subject, not expecting and not even trying to get the information back the first time. Um, and if we look over here, we can see a first attempt that, for whatever reason, Michelangelo abandoned entirely. So we have the best drawer who is one of the best drawers who has ever lived in one of the best drawings ever done. And we can see this idea of starting, trying it out, having it not work out, and just keep working at it. But the trick is that he did all of those initial steps as lightly as he could. So this is one of the first important keys to observational drawing is a drawing should start off incredibly lightly, and you should not expect that you're going to get it right the first time. And just like Michelangelo, you only darken the lines you want people to actually see. So, so that's, uh, those are the first ideas with drawing. You start off as lightly as you can. Don't expect to get it right the first time. Or oftentimes, as we saw with Michelangelo, you don't expect to get it right the third or fourth time. So the next idea you have to understand with observational drawing is that what a drawer does is they translate visual information into shapes that we can recognize and draw. So what I mean by that is um, if you take something, um, uh, something in organic form like a nose, you say, well, I don't know how to draw a nose. And what I often tell people is, well, I don't know how to draw a nose either. But I don't think about it as a nose when I'm drawing it. Now, this is a really critical uh, shift in perception here. So what a, uh, a good drawer does is they translate information into simple shapes. So I'm going to talk about shapes for a few minutes. I'm going to make a bold claim here. Now, just like we have three primary colors, right? We're all familiar with three primary colors. And those colors combine to create all of the other colors that we see um, in, in our visual field, right? So that's all our eye can see is green colors. Well, visual or um, a form works the same way. We actually only need to know three different kinds of shapes. And all form, no matter how complex, boils down to just a few basic shapes. So here we have the circle family. Circle family includes ovals, these little kidney bean shapes. Um, we have the square and rectangle family. So we have rectangles of all kinds. We also have some curving rectangles here. And of course the triangle family, and I threw in a couple angled lines here as well. Now, hopefully, you find these shapes pretty unintimidating, right? So I, I mean, we start drawing circles and squares when we're very, very young. So hopefully when you see you know, these just these quickly drawn shapes, you don't think, oh my gosh, I could never draw that. Like, these, are, these are accessible shapes, right? We could draw these shapes. So the trick is to get these shapes in the right place at the right time in the drawing. So I'm going to introduce you to four drawing questions. And when I draw, this is what I'm always thinking. And more importantly than that, this is the only thing I'm thinking. Um, and I'll go into why that's important in a few minutes. So the four drawing questions. So let's say you've got a subject to draw. And um, I'm actually going to uh, take you through um, these steps with, it, with an illustration. So we're going to go through these questions for now, but then I'm going to take you through it in an illustration. So before, when I sit down to draw something, the first thing I do, of course, is I just look. And I ask myself these three questions. What is the biggest shape in the subject I'm drawing? How big on the page should I draw? And where on the page should it go? So pretty basic questions, right? Now, once I've answered those three questions, just like we saw Michelangelo do, I'm going to make my first attempt as lightly as I possibly can, because I'm probably not going to get it right. So then we evaluate the shape, and then we ask the fourth and final question. Are there any changes I need to make before moving on to the next shape? Now, um, this is a critical question because Oftentimes, if people make an attempt in drawing um, and then uh, it doesn't work out, they start asking questions like, why wasn't I born with any talent? 
Why did I even think I could do this? Why did I, I, should, you know, I should be an artist? So they start talking to themselves in some pretty awful ways. And so, um, so it's my job um, to, uh, when I teach drawing classes to keep people focused on productive questions when they're drawing. So this is uh, asking this question, are there any changes I need to make before moving on to the next shape? The answer is yes, make them. And that's, that's kind of the secret recipe to drawing. It doesn't have to be an emotional response. You don't have to chastise yourself for not getting it right the first time. We simply evaluate what we put down. We make any changes, and we make them lightly. Once you're satisfied, you repeat the same questions with one minor change. What is the next biggest shape? And you just go on repeating these questions on and on. So, um, and later you darken the lines if you want to be seen by a viewer. So this is a, a quick drawing I did using only what I just taught you about drawing. So let's go through the questions really quickly here. So when we ask, what is the biggest shape? Now most people, if you ask them, or who aren't, who aren't uh, trained drawers, if you uh, show them a drawing like this and say, I want you to draw this, the brain tends to focus immediately on all of the detail and it pants. And it's probably a familiar feeling. I like to look at all that stuff on it. But if we break it down to these really simple shapes, it makes it much more accessible. So again, think of ourselves as translators now. We want to translate this into shapes. So what is the biggest shape in here? Well, the biggest shape I started with, and I don't want to give the impression that there's just one right answer here. There are multiple ways that you can, that you can, uh, that you can engage with these questions. But what shape do we have right here? All right, now. When you say, do you know how to draw the body of a bird? No, that's really complex. But can you draw an oval? Yeah, you can draw an oval, right? So, um, so this is the actual step-by-step -step that I went through with this drawing. I drew an oval. What is the next biggest shape? And again, for, um, for me, I like this shape here. Now, let's see how your translating skills are coming along. What shape is this? Rectangle. There you go. So, um, we're asking, what shape? How big on the page does it need to go? Where on the page does it need to go? So the oval needs to go over to the left. This rectangle needs to be attached and over to the right. Then we have the rectangle, right? So um, once we have this, we can go to some of the smaller shapes. Now, have I drawn anything you haven't recognized yet? <laughs> it's all basic shapes, right? Triangles, circles, ovals, a couple angles here. Now this step gets a little trickier, but, um, so I'm starting to add a little more detail here, but take a look. When we have marks like this, this is just half an oval, right? It's not even, it's, it's even easier than drawing a whole oval. <laughs> <laughs> so we have here a couple of curved triangles, just like we saw in the triangle family, right? We even have, again, half ovals. So I want you to feel your brain kind of moving through this process of not looking at it and saying bird or wing or foot, because nobody knows how to draw those things. But we are translating it into shapes we can recognize and that we are comfortable with drawing. So, um, and from here you can really get as, about as detailed as you want. And so again, whenever you look at a form, I want you to start um, translating shapes. It's a great habit to get into. And again, right here we can just see, you know, Rectangle, another oval, tiny little triangle at the bottom, right? Only these basic shapes. Everywhere you look, you can translate every single detail into a basic shape that you're familiar with and that you're comfortable drawing. So what do I actually do as an art teacher? So you'll notice that um, I haven't. when I taught you a little bit about drawing, I didn't talk about materials, right? So I don't really teach that much about materials, although there is some. Um, it's not really about teaching technique, although I do teach some technique, but really, I'm teaching students how to manage the conversation in their heads. That's the most important part of what I do, teaching students to manage the conversations in their heads. Once I realized this, it got me really interested in learning about what it's like to, what goes on in our minds, um, to learn about some psychology, to learn about how the brain works, how people think. And so I'm going to share with you now, we're going to switch gears a little bit, I'm going to share with you um, some of the most interesting research that I've come across and some of the, um, the research that has really influenced the way that I've thought about um, art teaching. There uh, is a woman named Carol Dweck. She is a, a teacher of psychology at Stanford. 
Um, she wrote a book called Mindset, and she has done a whole series of studies that start, that start out asking questions like this. She asks students, <clears throat> which statements do you agree with me? That you have a certain amount of intelligence and ability, and you can't really do much to change it? Or, do you agree with this statement? You can always substantially change your intelligence and abilities. So she would ask students, and ranging from uh, very young students all the way up to um, you know, grad students, uh, people going to med school, and, and even professionals. So to, uh, based on how people answer these questions, um, she would track um, how they dealt with education and specifically what they would do when they came across setbacks. So uh, what she's found is that um, people broadly fall into one or two categories. People either have a growth mindset, uh, which are the people that believe that intelligence and abilities can be developed, or people tend to have a fixed mindset, which means they believe intelligence and abilities are innate and fixed and cannot be developed. Now, uh, what she's found is these two groups have very different traits. People in a growth mindset, they interpret effort as a way to develop, as a way to get better at something, as a way to improve and increase their intelligence and abilities. But people with a fixed mindset, they interpret effort as, uh-oh, I've reached the limits of my capabilities. What a devastating thing to think when you come across a challenge, right? So people in the growth mindset, they seek out challenges because they know that's how they're going to grow. People with a fixed mindset start to avoid challenges because it might expose the limits of their intelligence and abilities. And so, of course, as a result, uh, students with a growth mindset, they remain engaged with learning and continue to develop. Students with a fixed mindset tend to disengage. And uh, growth mindset students reliably outperform uh, fixed mindset students across the board. So um, it's a really interesting um, way to look. And I don't have uh, all the time. I, I, I'd love to go into all of her graphs and data. It's really compelling, but I just wanted to introduce this idea. So um, going back to the drawing process that we just talked about, um, observational drawing is kind of like going to the gym for the growth mindset. And one of the things that Carol Dweck um, talks about is that, you know, it, just like going to the gym and exercising, if you're you know, lifting weights, that strength isn't only good for just lifting weights. You can use it with other things. And so um, developing the growth mindset, um, even in the context of drawing, really instills this idea in people that there is a process. And when we make an attempt, if something is hard, we just keep pushing forward. We go through iterations. We revise. We keep working at it until we achieve the proper result. Now, uh, again, this is something that is built into the drawing process. Never in the drawing process do we put a time limit on things and say, this is how long it should take, this is how many attempts it should take. The secret formula is that you keep going through those questions, you keep altering what you've drawn until you're satisfied. The only way to fail in that scenario is to give up. And so drawing really embeds this idea of the growth mindset. So... What I'd like to do now is talk a little bit about one of the big elephants in the room when we talk about our idea of talent. Now, uh, this is going to be one of the more controversial things that I'm going to say, um, and a lot of people disagree with me on this, and what's really not my idea. Talent is a word we hear a lot in, uh, um, regarding the arts. And there's um, a relatively young uh, body of research that's growing all the time that's finding over and over that talent is kind of a myth. We really don't see talent all that often. And this is talent defined as some innate ability. I cannot tell you how many times as an art teacher I hear, oh, the student's so talented. They just, you know, they, they just have, the, they have the gift. Um, so talent, um, I've taught thousands and thousands of students, and I have never come across anyone who seems to have any sort of innate natural ability. And when uh, people have been studying this idea of, of talent, and even going through history, when they search for the talented individuals, the geniuses, they come up short and hard to find. Um, my favorite example of this is Mozart, because this is one of the things. What about Mozart? Wasn't Mozart a genius? Well, maybe. But if you look back historically, if you look back beyond the myth of Mozart, we hear all these things like, oh, he started composing at six years old. He had his first masterpiece at 21. Well, here are a few things that you may not have known about Mozart. 
Um, Mozart's father literally wrote a book on how to teach children music. He was the most prominent music teacher in the world at that time. How convenient is that for young Mozart? So his father started Mozart at three years old, putting together music. So when we look at the idea of Mozart composing at a very young age, although this is true, um, what Mozart was actually doing is taking very simple standards, if you can imagine something like Mary Had a Little Lamb, switching a couple notes around and calling it original. Now this tends not to be the kind of genius composition people think about when they think about Mozart. Um, and uh, we know that Mozart uh, composed his first masterpiece at 21, and that is a very young age. However, his father had been brutally drilling the music industry into him since three years old. So when he was 21, he'd been a musician for 18 years. This is all he'd ever known in life. So um, by the time, and he was practicing hours and hours every day. Um, and so, is it really, does it seem that far-fetched that if anybody put into that scenario would start to, and you might not be able to compose, you wouldn't compose exactly what Mozart did, but this idea that you would come up with something, you would know music very well. Um, Carol Dweck, who we just uh, talked about, said, um, said this of Mozart, was it that he was a genius? Was it that he was talented? Or was it that he worked so hard at music that his hands became deformed? So it's something to really think about when we start throwing this idea of talent um, around. And um, so I'm going to make a, a bold proposal here. I'm going to ask everybody to stop using the word talent. And I'm going to give you a couple of, of reasons why. First of all, when you tell a student they are talented, what they hear usually is that they have some form of a gift. This is the epitome of the fixed mindset, that there is some innate ability and that, um, and that that's what they have. Now, if you tell somebody they have a gift, is practice that important? It sends the idea that, yeah, they might practice, they might do it, but they're doing it because they have a gift. And again, this is instilling this idea of the fixed mindset of the student. That means when they start to struggle, when it's somebody who believes they're talented starts to struggle, they are more likely in being concerned that they are running up against the limits of their capabilities. And um, in addition to working with a lot of young students, I also work with a lot of students in their 50s and 60s. And um, I would like to uh, share with you a story that I hear in every single class. In every single class, um, I ask, why students came, you know, why, why come to take a drawing class? And they, I get an answer like this. Um, this is a, uh, the opening line that I put into every single uh, class description that I have. Drawing is not a talent that is a skill anyone can learn. And so when I go around and ask students why they're taking this drawing class, every single class I get at least one person, usually men, who say something like this. When I was young, I either, A, had a teacher who told me I wasn't talented, or B, had a teacher who told another student they were talented, but not me. And that they just gave up on arts at that point. And they read this description, um, and they, they didn't believe it, but they wanted to come see, because they've always wanted to, to, to work in the arts or to do something with the arts. But, but they don't know if they believe it, but they want to come see, and that's why they showed up. And of course, they all improve, they all learn, um, they all get better. <clears throat> so the reason I'm saying this is that, again, it's a word that gets thrown a lot, and I don't know that I've convinced you um, that talent doesn't really exist, but telling a student that they're talented not only is potentially damaging to that student, but there's collateral damage that occurs in the classroom with people when a student here doesn't hear that they're talented. Um, that that could really impact their entire involvement with the arts. So what I'm saying is that the whole concept of talent is actually an argument against arts integration. So if we don't ban it from our classroom, we cannot make many head, uh, much headway in integrating the arts at all. Um, so I want to switch, uh, switch gears a little bit to a different kind of mindset that we haven't talked about yet. So, in 2010, IBM uh, did a survey of 1,500 CEOs from 60 different countries and 33 industries worldwide. 
and they were uh, they surveyed them to try and figure out what the most crucial factor for their future success was. Now again, these are CEOs from all over the country, all sorts of fields, and what they uh, came across was that the most important factor, creativity. Now this is something that a lot of people did not expect because this is the corporate world we're talking about now, right? Creativity is, is, a, is the most desired skill for people to have coming up. So around the same time, uh, the Wallace Foundation, along with Harvard's Project Zero, found that the number one thing a quality arts education can do is to develop the capacity to think creatively and to make connections. Now, creativity, like art, is a pretty tricky idea. In doing research for this presentation, um, I tried to find all of the terms, and I came across so many different and contradictory definitions for creativity. Some people think that creativity is just, it's an imagination. If you have a vivid imagination, that's being creative. Other people define creativity as, we well, have to actually do something. Some people said it was, uh, creativity was something that has to do something with the arts. Other people put it in with the sciences. So it's um, very, very different conceptions of what creativity means. So um, in an attempt to understand creativity for many years when I'm in a classroom, um, whenever I hear a teacher say to a student, be creative, sounds good, we've probably said, I've said it. I ask them, what does that mean? What does that mean to be creative? How is somebody creative? And so the answer I always get is, well, it means to think outside the box. What does that mean? So I mean, it's an easy thing to say, but we, it's really tricky to understand what creativity actually is and actually means, much less um, teach it. When we tell somebody to be creative, again, it's, it's, we have almost no thought process on how to do that. So I'm going to try and give you a very simple and practical definition of creativity, and it's one that, um, that doesn't just uh, remain the arts, but it can go outside the arts into a lot of different fields. But before I give you that definition, I want to talk to you about a few basic ideas regarding uh, human creativity. So the first idea that's critical to understand is this. Human beings don't really create truly new things. We can't. We're not, you know, we're not coming up with new elements. We are not coming up with completely new ideas. But what we are very good at, two things, we discover things, right? We discover a lot of things. But also, what we do is we combine things together. <clears throat> we're really good at combining things together. And so well, I'm going to define creativity um, and, and in a way that is really practical and applicable as the process of creating something novel by combining two or more existing things. So here's a little diagram I put together to kind of illustrate this idea of how human beings combine things together to create new things, right? Now, each one of these um, has its own history of either discovery or combining things together, but when we put it out in the equation like this, it starts to make sense, right? And you can actually do this with any innovation. You can go through and look at it. You know, you take something like the iPhone, it's what, um, telephone plus computer minus size, right? There we have the iPhone. So again, even these incredibly, um, things we think of as incredibly creative and innovative, actually boil down to really simple ways of thinking about them. So this idea of creativity is combining things together in new ways, making new connections. Now, um, when we talk about creativity for innovation, so in a field like, like technology, um, innovating requires a couple of things um, that younger students may not necessarily have. So a general knowledge of the world tends to be considered a requirement for innovation, so you know generally how the world works, which younger students tend to have a limited general knowledge of the world and also field-specific knowledge. Now those two things, students are developing, right? They're in the development um, of their learning about these things. Um, but um, what they do have is we can instill this idea of combining things together, getting them a comfort level with combining things together. So that way as their general knowledge of the world increases and they have field-specific knowledge, they're already used to making strange combinations. So I'd like to share a quote here. Um, this is a quote by Aristotle. Um, the pleasurable distortion of what is expected. 
Now, I really like this quote, and when I first came across it, I assumed he was talking about creativity. But is anybody familiar with this quote? You know what he's actually talking about? It's not creativity. This is Aristotle's definition for humor. The pleasurable distortion of what is expected. So I love this idea. Um, there's a whole new uh, body of research that um, is tracking what actually goes on in laboratories uh, when discoveries are made, when innovations occur. And what they're finding is usually there's some form of laughter. People are laughing, they're telling jokes. Because what is humor if not combining things in strange ways, right? And we think, talk about jokes. It's usually some unexpected thing that makes us laugh that we feel is absurd, and so we laugh at it. But many of the combinations of, uh, between things, many of these unexpected combinations in some ways are absurd. So humor can indirectly uh, stimulate discovery and innovation, and it is an amazing tool um, to bring into the classroom to get students comfortable with making these strange connections. So I've had a lot of really great experiences doing what I call combination projects. And combination projects I've done in all kinds of fields, um, you can um, do them cross-disciplinary or, and I'm going to give you a really basic version of one that I've just done in the art classroom with younger students. So I give them uh, some, some uh, rules uh, or some guidelines like this. I say, here are some magazines, here are some scissors, here are some glue sticks. You want to cut out from the magazines two arms, two legs, a body, and a head. But they don't actually have to be arms or legs if you want to use an asparagus for an arm or a planet for a head. You can do that. Once you've done that, assemble them um, together in at least three different ways so you can start to pose them in different ways and then place them together. So here's an example of what one of these things looks like. Now what I love about this project is that um, drawing, as wonderful as it is, is not inherently a creative act. It has to do with observation and analysis, and it takes a while to learn. But this project here, um, it doesn't require that much skill to immediately start making strange and bizarre connections between things that don't normally go together. So we can immediately find students, again, putting things together and asking, how could these things go together? So here's another example from this project here. A really great way to start to introduce students to creativity. Um, so really though, any project, and I'm not talking just about the arts here, but any time you can make a connection between two different fields, two different ideas, do it. And again, just adding in humor into this, you know, some of these, um, one, of the, one of my favorite things about this project is um, while teaching it, just like in a laboratory, um, before a discovery, there is so much laughter, there is so much exploration. It takes away the fear of having to be able to do something right or wrong, because these projects don't have um, a single outcome that we're going for, so they're, they're very open-ended. Um, and in fact, I, I have taught this project, I, I don't know how many times, um, in my, in my teaching career, but I never get tired of it because that simple set of rules yields different outcomes every time. Um, so sought after traits of creative people. So creative people are usually pretty comfortable with ambiguity. Now these combination projects really instill that idea because there is no one way solution. You can do the same project infinitely and never come up with the same um, solution. Uh, once. Um, the ability to make unexpected connections. Well, again, this is a huge one with uh, different kinds of combination projects. It really, um, that, that's at the, the heart of this, is making unexpected connections. And curiosity, what the um, combination projects also do is they allow um, people to say, how would, would these things fit together? Um, and once these, uh, these strange creatures are created, um, I often then say to people, what environment? might this creature live? How would it eat? What, what kind of things would it interact with? So then you're kind of off and running on a whole different way of thinking and research and invention based on a very kind of simple and silly project here. This is one of the big questions. Can we assess creativity? Now I feel like a lot of people translate this question into can we grade creativity, which is a very different question. And creativity is, I, I wouldn't say that it's very easy to try and grade, but there are some ways we can start to assess creativity. 
So some of the student learning outcomes um, that we can talk about with creativity um, are, uh, can students synthesize novel ideas in surprising ways? So there we have it again, this idea of combining existing things in strange ways. Can students ask questions to build upon an idea? Can students develop multiple solutions to a problem? Um, and can students communicate their ideas in unique ways? So I'd like to think the combination of things we've talked about, the combination of observational drawing, um, of, of interacting with, with projects, of understanding and creativity is combining things together, really starts to get at these ideas. So I'd like to close um, with uh, a few quick thoughts about modeling creativity. Now, I cannot tell you how many times I've gone into a classroom teaching art project, and um, I always encourage the teachers to participate. And I often hear the teachers say in front of the class, and they're like, oh, I don't have a creative button in my body. Or something like, oh, oh, I couldn't, I, I can't even draw a stick figure. Or, oh, oh, I'm not talented. Oh, there's that one. So, um, what kind of sign do you think this tells the students? Mm -hmm. If a teacher won't do the project because they think they can't, how do you think that impacts the students that are interested in learning for the arts? So I'm going to encourage everybody, and I know the teachers are required here, but model creativity for your students. Do the projects with them. Show that it is okay that you, we, as adults, are not afraid of exploring, of thinking new ways, of, of really engaging creativity um, in, in, in the classroom. So this is one of the things do, because if the students see us uncomfortable with it, they're less likely to do it. And the last thing I will leave you with is this. We talk a lot about um, arts integration as being really good for students, but it's also important to remember that this is not an age-specific thing. It's really good for humans. And being, a, being able to draw um, and having that as a communication tool, again, this isn't just a classroom skill. I can't tell you how many times I've gone to the hardware store and trying to describe a, a particular kind of screw that I want. It's like, oh, I'll just draw it. Ah, immediately they know what I want. Um, I cannot tell you how many times in my marriage where when something comes up, having the ability to think creatively to solve a relationship challenge. Um, and, you know, I, I'm at the point now where if I see an action movie, you know, and I see this, like, dramatic, you know, the hero kind of going through, the getting out of the burning, exploding building, I now find myself thinking, that is so creative. How did he think to do that? So, you know, this idea of creativity is not a not an art, just an art skill. It's not even just a corporate skill. It is a life skill, and it is good for all of us to integrate into our lives. So, thank you very much. Uh, my name is